We need to think deeply about why God designed sleep. Sleep is not an accident. God is the designer and promoter of sleep. Now, any of you sleepyheads tell people that. God designed it and promotes it. Okay, it's true. As believers who look at life through the lens of God's word, we need to see sleep as having the very signature of God written across it. When God designs something, it is very special and has specific purposes he wants us to know about. One of the clearest reasons for sleep is to remind us of this truth. And here it is, right here. God is God and we are not. But that follows with what sleep shows us. We are helpless, limited, and dependent. That's what sleep shows us. Now, you talk about a basic area that you can disciple and counsel someone on. There are few people in the world that will disagree with you about sleep. I mean, it's kind of like, ah, it's like breathing. Everyone does it. Okay, so now, what our lesson is tonight, David shows us how to sleep when fear surrounds you. Now, I got a... Um, I got a very interesting letter from a, a serviceman. I think he's out of there now, but he was in Afghanistan. And he was out in that helmet, or I don't remember. It's the bad province, the one we've already lost because we withdrew from it. But uh, he was in the one where the Taliban was regularly finding the bases surrounding and just mortaring them until we brought in our helicopters and you know, we'd chase them away. But you know what he told me? He said, you know, every night I go to sleep in and he was like one of those rangers, I don't know, you know, he's one of them that are out in the front lines. He said, you know, I sleep on a cot with camo netting over me, and that's it. He said, do you know what mortars are made of? Burning hot, melting steel from an explosion. He says, did you know my camo netting will not stop any mortar shrapnel? He said, do you know how hard it is to go to sleep? You know, wondering if they're going to lob one, you know, those Taliban mortars will. And he said, it'll just go right through my netting. How do you sleep when fear surrounds you? And, and he has become in my mind, you know, David, it's hard to imagine 3,000 years ago. The, the guy in Afghanistan, I can really picture that, okay? Well, the Bible, you can keep reading gives us an incredible lesson on fear, our weaknesses, and a daily way to reinforce our trust in God. Now, this is a very good discipleship lesson. This is a wonderful entree for counseling. Because one of the things when you're talking to people, you ask them about how they're doing sleeping. Now, I know there are medically induced sleepless reasons. There are dietary induced sleepless reasons. There are all kinds of things. But I'm talking about people who are sleepless because of fear, Anxiety, worry, whatever you want to call it. Those are the ones this lesson uh, is for. And by the way, all those uh, incredible lessons are packaged in Psalm 3. So we're going to be looking at Psalm 3. So just um, grab your Bibles and get there. And uh, I'm just going to show you, before we uh, uh, start in the lesson, I can't help. Um, it's kind of like... You know, someone that loves whatever they do, uh, before they do it, they explain it to you. We just had a repairman in the house doing something uh, in our house, and I'm glad he wasn't hourly, because he loved what he did so much, he was describing it to us, you know, and talking about his, his tools and everything. But since he was a per-job person, he could talk all he want. He was just using up his time, wasn't using up mine. But I don't want to use up your time too much, but here in your notes, I've given you four... Uh, points. Before you even enter a scripture, it's good to do a little observation. And here it is. Uh, this psalm is a part of a very special passage that we learn four things about. First of all, it's from God. Did you know every psalm in your Bible is from God? Did you know, as it says here, these words are in the Bible, God's words, so that means this message from God it is a message from God he wants us to have. This is also the first of the psalms that are called psalms. Notice Psalm 1 doesn't say psalm anywhere in it, and neither does Psalm 2. But look at the beginning of Psalm 3. 
a psalm of David. Isn't that interesting? Just for you to, to know. It's the first psalm attributed to David in the Psalter. It says, a psalm of David. And there are 72 others after this one ascribed to David, but this is the very first one. So it's from God. It's about David. Thirdly, it's to emphasize. This is the first time we see the term selah. How many of you notice the selahs, right? You notice them? Have you ever thought about what they're for? Selah is used three times in Psalm 3. It shows up 68 more times in 38 other psalms. Basically, this term is a pause for emphasis and reflection on what's just been stated. Have you ever noticed that, that professional speakers, uh, especially ones, I have a friend who's done the same talk 1,200 times. He did it here. You, you probably didn't even know he'd done it 1,200 times. His name was Todd Arend. Any of you remember when he was here? Do you know that, that he knows just when to stop because the whole audience erupts? He has told that talk 1,200 times. He knows just when to start back up. He tells another one. He backs off. Everyone erupts. He has done it so many times, he knows it. Did you know what selah means? It means stop. I just said something so important. You better read over that till you catch it. That's what selah means. It means pause. Uh, emphasize what you're seeing. Reflect on what has just been stated. So this is the first of the emphasized psalms. It's about David, and it's directly from God. But look at that. That's not the only thing about this psalm. It's got a setting. This is the first inspired setting to any psalm. Notice the rest of the title in Psalm 3. It says, a psalm of David. So it's from God. It's a psalm. It's, it's about David. Uh, when he fled from Absalom, his son. Here we find a message from God to each of us on how to deal with fear. David flees for his life, pursued by his own son. What a fearful and sad time in life, and what a rich time to learn from God, who is able to help us in time of need. So what we have here is a divine context. This is actually a psalm totally written about fear. Not about fear in the abstract. It's not talking about fear out there somewhere that possibly someday this might happen to you. It's about a real fear. It's about my friend in Afghanistan with the netting, you know? What's the divine context? Well, the biblical setting for this psalm is 2 Samuel 15, 30. If you want to cross-reference your Bible so you always remember this lesson, note that reference by the psalm. In fact, I actually have written right in my psalm, or right there by Psalm 3, 2 Samuel 15, 15 or 13 to 32. Uh, because it starts in verse 15. You can just put 30 to 32, but remember 2 Samuel 15. Now I printed out for you what it says. This is what it says. Now David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went, and he had his head covered, and he went barefoot. Do you all see in pictures? Can you imagine one of the greatest warriors that's ever lived? Walking barefoot, crying, with his head covered. You know, think of a football player with a towel over his head, barefooted, crying. Wouldn't that stop you and you'd look at him? You know, this massive guy. David never lost a battle. He was never wounded. He fought hand-to-hand -hand combat with thousands of people, with arrows flying. And it wasn't on TV, so he's the star, so he never gets hurt, you know, it, like in movies. This was real. He would come back from battle. You know what God described him as? He said, you're a man of blood. When you fought hand to hand, you got covered. You came back red. That's, that's how close battle was. I mean, you, didn't, you weren't a sniper at 2,200 yards. You were only an arm's length away from each other. That's the only way you won. You had to get that close and get them. So here's this mightiest warrior with his head covered, barefooted, and all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went up. He was really a leader. You're a leader when everyone does what you do. Verse 31, and someone told David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators. And David said, O Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Verse 32, now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain. What mountain would that be? Mount of Olives. Where was David living? city of Jerusalem. 
This is fascinating to think that that spot is still there, hasn't moved. Uh, so he goes to the top of the Mount of Olives where he worshiped God, and there was Hushai and all that. So in other words, look back down at your Bible in Psalm 3. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son, and he writes this, this worship to the Lord. So we even know the setting of this psalm. Right here it is. It's in 2 Samuel 15. That's where David, at the top of the mountain, worshipped God. Now, I don't think he wrote it there. I don't think he stopped and, you know, got out his writing tablet, you know, and wrote it. But that's where these events took place. That's where he made a connection with God. Okay, remember how we get to Psalm 3. Uh, there are three events that are going on in 2 Samuel 15. God's word details the consequences of David's sin with Bathsheba. This event is one, and there were many parts to it, okay? First of all, simmering troubles. You know about uh, 2 Samuel 13 talks about Ammon raping Tamar, and uh, her brother Absalom murders him. Those are all David's kids, by the way. So one of his kids gets killed by another of his kids because that kid raped another kid. You talk about family problems. Isn't that family problems? Those are things we don't even talk about in public, and they happen to David. You understand that? See, that's why the Bible is so neat. It's real people with real problems and divine solutions to the problems. That's what's fascinating about this. Secondly, there were family ruptures. Uh, right here, that's 2 Samuel 14. Absalom flees to his mother's hometown in the Sea of Galilee, hides out and stays away a total of five years. You ever heard of families that have people don't talk to each other, move away, you know, blah, 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 blah for, for years? This is real stuff. This goes on in families. And all this is building up with David. I mean, his son killing another son after he rapes the sister, and then he leaves. This was probably David's favorite son. He was handsome as can be. This is the guy with all the hair. Uh, he cut it once a year and it weighed five pounds. Wow. Should have donated it to the Cancer Society, really, instead of selling it. But, uh, okay, thirdly, a dangerous situation. Absalom, the murderer up there, moves, striking out in treason as a usurper to David's throne. That's what chapter 15 is about. That's the background of Psalm 3. And so basically, the lesson is that God's teaching us how to worship God even through fearful times. Through them, not after them. Most of us are great. After the surgery, after the, everything turns out okay, and we're totally recovered seven months later, we look back and say, wow, isn't the Lord good? You know what's even better? Through the times. And that's what this third psalm is about. Even though David is fully restored in his relationship to God, David has to learn about facing and dealing with the pain and fears that come from personal attacks and verbal abuse. These lessons are captured in the words of Psalm 3. Absalom seeking to kill him. After making it out of Jerusalem into a defensible position, David is allowed to rest. And God is teaching David and us to this day that we can rest. And, and just think about that. In our fearful times, we can rest. Imagine with me the men surrounding David that was described earlier in the account of 2 Samuel 15. Joab, the commander-in-chief of David's army. What was he doing at this time? Now remember... This whole setting of this psalm is David is walking barefooted out of Jerusalem, weeping with his head covered. He goes out of Jerusalem, down the bottom of the Kidron, walks up to the top of the Mount of Olives. He pauses on the top of the Mount of Olives and worships God. Then they keep going. If you read the, the rest of 2 Samuel 15, they get out in the wilderness, and they make camp out in the wilderness. So Joab is undoubtedly working feverishly in his preparation to protect David. Guards were posted, troops were stationed, concentric rings of defenses, were planned to prepare so that the 600 seasoned soldiers who marched out with David were arrayed to face any army or enemy that might attack on this very vulnerable night that David just was run out of town. Joab was worried a frontal assault by Absalom's army could overwhelm his perimeter. He was tense. He came back to camp. He considered taking David deeper into the wilderness or finding some other spot. With his head spinning on all these thoughts, he greeted David, but instead... But as we'll see, instead of being rattled or despondent, here's what Absalom found 
David was experiencing God. That's the setting of the third psalm. You notice it says right before the third psalm, this psalm of David was when he fled from Absalom his son. I really think that the, the event took place on top of the Mount of Olives. I think he wrote it that night as he got to camp. Because the whole psalm is about laying down and going to sleep when surrounded by troubles. For the first time in hours, Joab got to see David all alone and sensed something was completely different about him. Gone were the red swollen eyes of the morning. Back were the clear bright eyes he remembered from so many years of fighting alongside this giant of a man. Instead of anger, self-pity, or fear, David was calm, peaceful, actually joyous as he began to tell Joab what the Lord had done in his heart. Incredulous, Joab smiled, shook his head, and hurried off to check the defensive positions one more time. When Joab returned, he was struck with an even more amazing sight. David was kneeling on the ground in front of a rock, an animal skin unrolled on top of the rock in front of him, and with pen and ink in hand, he was busily writing, just like Joab remembered from those days in the cave of Adullam. Those cave times were over a dozen years earlier when David wrote Psalm 57 and 142. Just like then, Joab remembered David's peace in those days of fleeing from King Saul. When David wrote Psalm 17, 54, 35, 36, 53, 16, and 39, and now his king was added again. Once finished, David held up the scroll in the fading light of the evening sky. He read it over quietly, sang the words to a tune he'd just made up, rolled it up, tied a cord about it, tucked it into his cloak. David had just written another song. It was Psalm 3. And then he turned, unrolled his sleeping bag, laid down, and soon was sound asleep. In the very presence of his enemies in the middle of the camp that could be overrun at any moment, David slept. And Joab marveled again at this man after God's own heart. Where we decide to turn in our most desperate moments and how we face what we never wanted or dreamed of ever happening reveals what is really on the inside of us. And what came out of David at this excruciating time was a song that was so good, God forever recorded it in heaven. You know, I was thinking about what did iTunes get there? How many billionth music download recently? They just made another record. And I thought, you know, all those music writers are writing their millions of best sellings, but there are only a few songs that are forever recorded in heaven. Have you ever thought about that? And we have them. Because it pleased the Lord, this song was better than any of today's top charts, top of the billboard, or gold or platinum. Here's the exact recording, and it's right in front of you. And just look down at this. Look what Psalm 3 says. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are those who rise up against me. Yeah, the whole country, the whole army is going to come against him of the country. Many who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Now what's the next word? What does that mean? Stop and think about it. And that's what this psalm is like. Well, the setting of this psalm is part of God's word. That's why it says, while he was running from Absalom. The line about fleeing from Absalom was written down to emphasize that this is a lesson we all need to learn. And here's the lesson. When fear stalks, God says, fear not. Now, it's interesting. God doesn't take away the source causing the fear. He just tells us we have to do something that pleases him. Do you remember what it says in Hebrews 11? But without what? It's impossible to please him. Yeah, say it louder. But without what? Faith. You know what faith is? When fear stalks, you have to obey God and say, fear not. I'm not going to fear. It's kind of like, I remember that I used to have to walk to my parents' car after church on Wednesday night, and they always parked so far from the church, and they did not have any street lights back in Lansing, Michigan, back in the really early 1960s and late 50s. And I remember I was so afraid of the dark. Now, I know most of you were never afraid of the dark, but I was afraid of the dark. Um, I just thought for sure there was some snake or animal or monster hiding in those shadows. And I remember that I would walk there, and, it, and either I would say a verse, or I'd hum or sing something from prayer meeting, and I'd get into the car and shut the door. 
As if I was safe in the dark in the car. I don't know. But the lesson is, when fear stalks, God says, fear not. And Psalm 3, in your notes, is set in the context of battles. If you trace through the verse, you'll find the setting uh, to be about seven different indicators of warfare. In verse 1, he was facing foes or adversaries. In verse 3, he needed a shield. In verse 6, David saw the people deployed like an army set against him or drawn up against him. David calls them, in verse 7, his enemies. And he cries, Arise, Lord, which is one of the terms for entering a battle. Uh, verse 8 says the armies were, were, the word people is used for an army. In verse 8, he wanted deliverance, which was also... Thanks, Dave. We could just enjoy the choir rehearsal or whatever's going on there. Okay, so what the Lord says is, Selah, after each of those divisions, you notice I stopped at the end of verse 2 at the Selah, and I want you to learn, because I actually methodically take people through this, and I'll show you how I do it. Selah means think upon God's lessons. And Psalm 3 divides up the message God gave through David by the use of Selah at the end of the verses 2, 4, and 8. Selah means lift up. It's a musical term for a crescendo. It means boom it out, or crank it up, or punctuate that with emphasis. In other words, David was saying, hey, look at that. And when you see the word selah, God wants you to stop and ask yourself, what do I think of that? So let's go through God's lessons for David. And, and these are, these, these are what, what we need to not say so fast that people can't process them. So I actually slowly go through these with people. Here's the first one. In verse 2, David said, many are those who say of me, there's no help from him for him in God. Selah. So boom. Stop and consider this. God cares about you. What do you think of that? Well, the lesson is David paused and thought about it. And as he looked back, the people said that there's no help from you from God, David paused and thought about it. And he found his whole lifetime had definite proof that God had cared for him. Do you know, in our hard times, we're supposed to see law, and we're facing the unknown, the, what we never wanted to face, but before we face it, we go like this, and we say, wait a minute, the Lord has always taken care of me. The Lord has always provided. The Lord came and sought me when I didn't even know him. He, he loved me before I knew or loved him. And so David, first of all, thought about it, and he found a lifetime of, of definite proof God cared for him. Now look at verse 4 in your Bibles. It says, I cried the Lord to my voice. He heard me from his holy hill. Selah. In verse 4, David said, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Selah. Stop and consider this. God will continue to rescue you. What do you think about that? The lesson was this. David reflected on his steadfast hope and confident faith that God who had rescued him in the past would continue to do so. It's the same idea. The God who cares about you will keep rescuing you. And then in verse 8, you can see in your Bibles, if, if uh, you're following along there, another Selah. And it was, salvation belongs to the Lord, Selah. And what that means is, salvation belongs to the Lord is, God alone can save us. David reflected upon the truth that God alone can save us from all of our deepest troubles. See, that's what faith is about. God was, was training David in what faith is about. God was the only one that really cared for him. God is the only one that, that could rescue him. God is the one that can save us. The same way he saved us from hell, he can save us from being overwhelmed by whatever comes down the pike. So, the next line, these uses of Selah make three clear divisions. And, and I'm just going to run through them. I'm not going to... Uh, read all this, you can read it, but first, like David, we'll all face battlefields, and I explain that to you. Uh, and there are many kinds of battlefields. Our workplace, personal attack slander, parents who turn against them, kids who turn against them. We all have battlefields. 
Secondly, like David, we'll all have to make choices. And David made choices, and you can read about his choices. Uh, but finally, and, and this, is one, this is why I want to have time for us to go through this, like David, we all need sleep. And, and get to that last division there. At the end of one of the most grievous days of his life, and this is how we started this lesson tonight, David rested in the Lord. He said, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. Sleep is a gift from God to help prepare us to start over again tomorrow, refreshed and renewed. It is also a picture of how much we need God, and even more, how we receive his salvation. Sleep should decimate any pride we have in our own power or might, because we can't even keep ourselves alive or even awake. And think of how weak we are. Get over to the group Bible study, and this is what I want to assign you. And we have a good, solid, you know, 25 minutes. This is, this is a, a wonderful record. But let me go over it with you. Um, first, you know, you read verses 1 and 2, and then stop, and, and in that little space, what are some of your personal battlefields? And if you don't feel comfortable uh, telling a significant one, tell a light one. You know, like, I struggle liking it being warm, and I don't like the winter. That's a, you know, no one gets upset about knowing that about you. And then read verses 3 and 4, and, and talk about whether you're focusing on your troubles, uh, because anxiety is meditating on your problems, but peace is believing his promises. So pause for that. Then you read Psalm 5 and 6 and do that. And then sleep lessons for life. This, this, the sleep lessons for life section, take turns and read this out loud. Because this is the heart of a theology of sleep. And, and one of the, the wonderful things, and this is what I say, uh, go to that personal applications part. Uh, and I would really like you to try this tonight because you can tell people you counsel if you actually do this. Step one, as you crawl into bed tonight, pause and remember as you entrust your body to be held securely through the night, lift your heart and worship to God who holds your soul in the sweet comfort that you're lying in his arms. So you just actually lay there and instead of whatever else you think about, think about the fact, and I used to do this, I was a real bad little boy. My, I would be wild in the car when my parents were driving home from something, but as soon as I recognized where we were, I would act like I fell asleep. I did that every time we drove in the car at night. And I would just flop because I had learned my dad would carry me in. And so I would just be, you know, as limp as possible. And, and he was really a big, he was a prize fighter. He was really a big, strong fellow. And he would get in the back seat of the car, and I can still, you know, 55 years later, I can still feel him getting me carefully, and he'd pick me up, pull me out of the car, and he'd put me over his shoulder, and he'd carry me into the house. Of course, he'd say, I know you're not sleeping. But, uh, <laughs> but he enjoyed it, too. Well, think of that. Think of... When you go to sleep, I know you're on your, you know, select comfort air mattress or whatever you're on, your Sealy Posturepedic, but actually think about the Lord's arms because we're unconscious. No matter how good your security system is, it's really God that's protecting us. Step two, tell the Lord you're resting your life in him. Whisper that you completely need him, that you're trusting in his care. Ask him to get rid of any pride you may have built up through the day. Why? Because you have to humble yourself that I can't even keep myself awake, God. How can I be proud about anything? I can't even perpetuate life without going to sleep. So please, you know, I humble myself before you. And then step three, go to sleep resting in the arms of the one who never slumbers or sleeps and who promised to watch over us and be with us all the days of our life. Did you know that going to sleep every night can become an exercise in trusting God? It really deepens our walk with the Lord. And that's the supreme peace David felt as he laid down in the presence of his enemies and slept. And so should we humbly and completely in dependence upon the Lord. So go through your readings and discussions and then read the sleep lessons for life and then talk about how you're going to go to sleep tonight, okay? So we have until 10 to and then share time and pray.
and let's go to our small group time.